women to movements and you know and to work with others in struggles today. Um, so we're opening the meeting today with a discussion on neoliberalism, austerity and resistance. Uh, each speaker will speak for around 15-10 minutes and then I will introduce them as they speak um, and then after we'll be time for some questions. Uh, so this is the room where the main meetings will take place, the plenaries. The other meetings will be in um, a building which is kind of signposted, so if you leave here it's like over there, that's where the smaller meetings are. Um, but ask any of people on the reception desk if you're not sure where it is. Um, and so I think we'll just get started. So the first speaker is Neil Davidson. He's a, a Marxist uh, and he does, he's got a collection of essays coming out next month <laughs> called Holding Fast to an Image of the Past and he's got a book on neoliberalism coming out in that, at the end of this year. Um, so he's going to speak first. Okay comrades, I've been asked to speak about neoliberalism as a, an era or a stage in the history of development of capitalism. So I suppose the first question we have to ask is, what is a stage in the history of development of capitalism? And probably the simplest way to think about it would be a way in which the mode of regulation or accumulation of capital changes. So we can think about um, the period opened in 1873, that was the first major shift. Um, the period opened in 1929 would be the second. And the period opened in 1973, the beginning of the new liberal period itself as a third. But there were actually, in a fourth period, when it opened in the crisis of 2007-8, I think is an open question, an interesting one, because we seem not to keep it out of the neoliberal period, which is why we're having this discussion. So what that suggests, given those dates, is that a period, a period or a stage of capitalism both opens and closes with a period of crisis. And that seems to be the kind of bracketing thing that determines what a period is. So the one that opened in 1873 is known by many names. Uh, the period of finance capital, of state monopoly capitalism, of imperialism, is usually the terms that you think of that period. Uh, and, and obviously imperialism is one of the key characteristics, as well as the fusion of banking and industrial capital. The period opens in 1929 is more clearly one of state capitalism per se, uh, and one that lasts all the way through to 1973 and the origins of the neoliberal period. Now I think one thing that comes out of that, if those periods are correct, that they're identified, then it's clear that they include periods of both boom and slump. They're not carried out just by one. Because we have a tendency to think about the period at the end of World War II, um, the, the golden age, um, the period of the great boom, as being a period in its own right. But actually, I think that's wrong. I think the period actually starts in 1829, and if you like, the boom part of the cycle starts in 1945 and 48, that takes us forward. So if we're saying that a period is, is, is there's distinct periods in capital systems, does that mean they're totally unique? <laughs> Clearly not, there are continuities in all of them. I mean, for one thing, there's a general characteristic of capitalism is the replacement of living with dead labor. That is with human beings and workers being replaced by technology and machinery. And that's in some ways part of capitalism for the world goal. And that's clearly happened in both the neoliberal period and the preceding period. So there's sort of really those constants, if you like. Similarly, um, imperialism or the geopolitical struggle of different national capitals um, for territory and so on, that's also something that's characteristic, at least in the period since. 1873, and then continues to this day as the current struggle in Ukraine and Crimea suggests to us. So I'm not suggesting that we talk about a new liberal period, I'm talking about something where everything just starts afresh and it's totally no connection with what's happened before. Non -continent. There are there are these continuities that go through it. But what does happen is some specific things take place um, that, are, that are distinct. Now, for me, neoliberalism, um, if you put it to one side, is a kind of ideological term that emerged in the 1930s from the, the Austrian and German um, order when Paolo neoliberals hide the co. Now forget about that. Then it seems to me that neoliberalism begins as a strategy, as an actual ruling class strategy um, to, to basically restore profitability at the expense of the working class in general terms, both attacking the social wage and driving down the amount of, of, of profits and growth to pay labour to its simplest. And that starts in a handful of countries, um, in, in Britain, in America, in Chile, um, primarily. But we have to understand that uneven development occurs here. Um, the, the whole process of what we call, come to call neoliberalism, privatization, deregulation, the shift from direct to indirect taxation, and so on, uh, is, is first established by Thatcher and, and Arabian regimes, <laughs> and, and, and by Pinochet in Chile, in non democratic conditions, of course. Um, but it isn't, um, it isn't the case that everyone therefore has to go through the entire period, the entire process that led to those things happening. People, some states just pick up 
where Thatcher left off at the highest point of development of new liberalism. Not everybody has to go through the incredible struggles and stages that happened in Britain. New Zealand, for example, was one of the most complete um, neoliberal regimes, opposed by the Labour Party, actually, from 1984 onwards in that country. They didn't have to go through everything. But Britain did seem to be at the point of highest development, as I mean, well, it suggests. So neoliberalism, there's only two periods to it, if you like. The first one, which I call the period of vanguard neoliberalism, the period of Thatcher and Reagan and so on, um, is the one in which the three things are done to kind of establish um, the, the, the ground rules, if you like. One is high unemployment to tear the working class as a deliberate and conscious strategy uh, boosted by high interest rates, um, the non bailing out of the killing companies and so on. The second is a conscious attack on specific and important trade unions. And in America, that was the air traffic controllers, PATCO, um, and in Canada, that was postal workers, in India, <laughs> and the cotton workers in, in Italy, and, and during quickly, and car workers, and of course, in Britain, the miners, uh, and then fleets to do it as well. Stuck in. Not an attempt to crush the trade union movement, this is important, but an attempt to tame it and to make trade union leaders understand that if they attempt anything like the miners, like again, they'd be smashed, that the union would be destroyed, their funds would be sequestrated, and all the rest of it. It doesn't seek to destroy the unionism, it seeks to tame it and make sure that the bureaucrats understand the limits by which, beyond which they cannot go. So that's the same thing. The third thing is a more molecular kind of process in which production was shifted from the traditional areas like Glasgow and Manchester. And so on, two areas which uh, were, were not unionized, were not traditionally uh, areas of production in place uh, as a way of, 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 of basically uh, getting around to unionism and of organizing greenfield sites was not clear. It wasn't, the problem was not work being shifted to China or Bangladesh. That was always a kind of strong man argument. It was about production being shifted within the metropolitan areas themselves. So in one, the M4 corridor in the south of England, Silicon Glen, and in Scotland, or the, the, the so called the Deep South strategy in America, from the Rust, Rust Belt, the Sun Belt, um, and often in America relying on, on non recognized migrant labor, of course, to carry out these kind of tasks. So these are the kind of three strategies of neoliberalism in Britain and America in particular, um, the vanguard phase, and this is what Gramsci calls uh, a regime of reorientation. He was thinking about um, Mussolini, he wrote this, but it seems appropriate here as well, where there's a new strategy for capital required, one which cannot be carried out by the people who are currently ruling by the Labour Party in Britain or Jimmy Carter's Democrats in the States. It has to be carried out as a new force altogether that's committed to this. And incidentally, I saw recently the minutes of the cabinet uh, meetings that Thatcher presided over during the minor strike. And here we have a genuine leader of our class saying, I want the troops to go in there, the police to go in there, I want these welfare benefits to be cut at the top. And she's actually doing this. This is, this is ruling class leadership. I mean, Reagan didn't do this because he was a kind of glove puppet. Be working back with that, was a genuine class warrior, or literally leading uh, in these kind of pieces of government work. So, it's very interesting actually to get them online, um, just been released a couple of months ago. So, that was the first phase. The second phase uh, is what I think it was the social neoliberalism, the social regime, uh, you know, a regime of consolidation, as Bernie Anderson calls it, where people understand it's impossible to simply carry on attacking in the kind of aggressive first 10 years or so of uh, neoliberalism. You have to have some kind of uh, compensatory. Mechanisms, and this is usually about with social policy. The idea of you know really gay marriage, or you know with the opposed to racism in an official way. It's we still maintain the hardcore economic program. You know, we've extended this uh, dramatically in terms of privatisation and so on in this country. But we have you know we have all these other issues that we are you know, kind and sympathetic and do anything about. Um, you know, so we get Tories now saying that we're gay marriage or something anyway and so on, which would be the case 20 years ago. So this is the kind of second phase. And since then, what you've, you've always got is to alter possible alternative versions of neoliberalism, this kind of vanguard or, or, or social version, and that's the quicks the Tories alternating in the 18th century, if you like. They both have the same economic positions, but have slightly different social positions. So clearly, Barack Obama's position on racism is going to be somewhat different to George W. Bush's, but nevertheless, the economic policy will be that is, is essentially the same. So, um, Okay, good. So just to say something about how um, neoliberalism has affected both the working class and the ruling class in different ways, because in a sense it's, it's a problem for them both, uh, for us and for them. Here I think we have to reject a certain kind of argument of neoliberalism, which is very associated with Michel Foucault and some of his followers, which is that you know, neoliberalism has entered into our very souls, and people's entire lives are turning themselves into entrepreneurial subjects, and so on, and it's like a science fiction view. Of the liberalism that we should, we, should, we should reject. It has weakened the working class. There's no point pretending otherwise. 
primarily by weakening trade unions, and the number of people who are in trade unions, should people know the figures, then the private sector of this country is about 14 percent, so they under people are unionized. And the public sector is much, much bigger, it's in, it's in the upper 30s, uh, and that's historic gains um, for, for public sector workers. But it's a disaster for only 14 percent in the private sector. It doesn't mean people can organize where they are, particularly in engineering and, and telecoms and so on, but actually this is a problem. It doesn't mean people don't want to be in the union, so they would do it if they got the chance. I think that's probably true, but they're not getting the chance. And therefore, there's a huge strategic question of how that kind of problem can be overcome. And there's also a difficulty in that social democracy hasn't simply accepted most of the right wing positions in CEO, I think, in its history. It's actually brought on board the whole neoliberal agenda in economic terms. I mean, you just have to listen to balls in Miliband and the stuff about austerity and how they would carry on with it and all the rest of it to understand this. Any illusions in this, I think, have to be completely broken with. The idea that somehow Labour is going to get back to some sort of golden period before this is simply a joke. Um, they, they, and they're asked problems for working class consciousness because the idea of even a kind of reformist class consciousness, the set of assumptions that revolutionaries would have in common with reformists, a common kind of vocabulary and understanding of certain things, has been weakened. It hasn't been destroyed or completely negated. It, it has been weakened. And again, we have to understand that for doing a bit. And just more generally, the whole if you like, life world, which might be like a terminology of the working class, has changed dramatically since when I was a kid in the 1960s. You know, the kind of, you know, you go to a state school, you tell them a state bus from the local council, you go to a British rail train, visit your relatives, and we'd all be in the trade union, and at least half of the family worked in the NHS, and stuff like this, and all the members of Malibu, etc., etc. That kind of thing, you know, automatically, you know, shop at the cooperative society. And so they collected up dividends and all that. So that, that kind of thing has been eroded for most people. And the kind of things that give people a kind of sense of collectivity and, and so on. So it has been recreated, but there, are, there is a benefit from it from come up at the end, when we're on a positive note. Um, but there's a problem for the ruling class as well, which I think we have to understand. And that's it. Um, it's not just the, the so called apathy that affects people because of the, the growing sim similarity between all parties. It's not apathy, it's just a contempt, and for most cases, for the parties themselves. And understand that none of them represent working class people. That's, so that's not, in a sense, a bad thing for us, it's a good starting point. That people recognize that problem. For the ruling class, though, there's a real danger for them, and the neoliberalism has actually introduced a situation in which actual capitalists are closer to ruling than any time in, in history. This is a real problem for the capitalist class. If you read any of the great social thinkers, so Adam Smith onwards, their view is, oh my god, this is a disaster. You know, Smith said that the worst possible government you can imagine is a government of merchants. Uh, Marx makes the same point in Capital about the Factory Acts. He says, These idiots didn't want the Factory Acts, the capitalists didn't want the Factory Acts. The government had to force them to accept the Factory Acts. The state had to force this. Or Schumpeter, you know, right winger, in many ways, close to Hayek, saying, you know, Capital needs a master. It needs a state that does what it long term thinking that doesn't do what they immediately want, which keep of saying no to big corporations and so on. That's going. It's not gone, it is going. And that means that the, the, the kind of immediate responses of capital, you know, we want this and we want it now, and we want it in a three month period so our shareholders get value for what's happening. But when people talk about financialization, a lot of this is not is talk nonsense talking about financialization, but what has happened is that the kind of the goals of capital are now in line with finance capital. They want short term returns, they want immediately, which means nobody's doing any long-term planning, the state is not thinking about the interest of the system as a whole. Now that can lead to further disaster and, and crisis and so on, which isn't necessarily in our field, but it means there's a weakness at the heart of their leadership and the way they think. And um, they'll be like banks and so on, beyond that there's no real strategy. Okay, positives to end I think the first thing is that what we're seeing here um, is, is actually, although there's been a weakening of structure and organization in a certain sense of consciousness, there's also been an intense volatility put into the situation. Which, in a sense, you see the explosions in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Ukraine, and Spain, and you know, and of course, not all in the Arab Spring, even to a certain extent, that some of the things that happened in this country. A volatility which social democracy can no longer control in the ways that it used to be able to do. That's a positive thing for us, because it means that these things, when they happen, the relatives can intervene with some kind of actual leadership that might make sense. But I think it does mean, though, as my concluding thought, is that we have to understand that the class struggle. Anyway, but especially with the new liberals, it isn't just unionized workers fighting for trade conditions in the workplaces. It means any time where workers are engaged in struggle against capital and its effects, which means over housing, over the bedroom tax, over racism, these are all parts of the class struggle. They're not a second order set of things that we do for not too busy fighting for a wage increase. They're actually central to the whole thing. And in some cases, under the new liberal regime, it's actually easier for people to engage in those kinds of struggle and become 
politically involved because it's more difficult to work in the workplace. So you have to be open to all that, understand it's going to happen, and expect the unexpected. That's what Benjamin said we should do all those things. Thank you. Elizabeth. Now we've got Maria, who's an activist in North London, um, and she was involved in the Spanish Elite and the M15 movement and a abortion rights protest there, so she's going to speak for, for about 10 minutes. First of all, I'm going to speak about Elizabeth's actuality. On the, on, on the 22nd of March, the uh, the March of Dignity uh, took place with two million people demonstrating under the slogan Housing, Bread and War in Madrid. 700 coaches from Andalusia in the South alone when and, and there was also mobil mobilizations from all the unions including the biggest union CCOO and UGT and the three smaller but more radical uh, unions, CGT, SAG, and YAC. The demonstration also involved the working class in the broader sense, with migrants, feminists, retired people, and slogans in favor of abortion rights. Independence for Catalonia, Galicia, and the Basque Country, with a unity that was not there previously. It's also important to say that this mobilization had been built from below. Going back to the 15M movement, 4 million people participated in the movement in the mass assemblies that took place in the squares of different cities and towns around the Spanish state. And this completely changed the trend of submission at the time. At the beginning of the crisis, in 2008, the Spanish state had the highest number of temporary contracts and unemployed convened, convened with the lowest wages and social exp expenditure in Europe. Unemployment at the time was 5 million, now it's more than 6 million. 21% of the active population of whom may receive no benefits. Up to that point, there had been only low level resistance against the cuts. The bureaucracy of the largest trade unions in the Spanish state at the time did not inspire much confidence, and as you can expect, ne neither do they now. Unlike the British unions with views paid, they are financed by, financed by receiving state subsidies, which is dependent on the number of delegates elected from workplaces or workers, both in the elections, whether union members or not, which means most people don't think they need to be part of a union. Not having to depend on their members' dues has made Comisiones Obreras and UGT, which control 85% of delegates, very top, top uh, heavily and bureaucratic. These unions are mainly in large workplaces and in public sector, so the precarious workers are unlikely to come across unions in their jobs. The Spanish Labour Party, the sole reaction to the crisis at that moment, was a state intervention to save the banks and inject cash unsuccessfully to re revive economy, which led to a negative effect of the crisis passed from the private sector to the public sector. Then the prime, the prime Minister imposed 5% wage cut to the public sector workers and in 2010 announced an austerity package. The two main trade unions, in response to this call, a general strike in September 2010, which involved 5 million people, and rather than take advantage of the mobilization, opt to negotiate with the government which resulted in a retirement age being raised and reform being put that would make it easier to sack people. Politically, non-aligned movements are not new in a Spanish state. In 2002, 500,000 people were mobilized in Barcelona against the capital 
and war, and in 2006, Uve de Vivienda emerged after a campaign of text messages that at that time were really new, uh, and led to the demonstrations over the high cost of housing. And even though the demonstrations prior to N15 movement involved mainly militant minorities, the anger was growing. We saw the manifest. It's, we saw this manifest itself when when the health workers started a radical strike, which was out of the hands of the bureaucracy, which led to a demonstration of 100,000 on the 14th of May, 2012. The next day, the 15M movement broke out and opened a process of civil disobedience massive demonstrations, the largest in 35 years in Spain, occupation of public spaces, bounds, squares, etc. This movement inspired a new layer of activists and renew a new generation to be active in politics. It has also revitalized many organizations and unions and pushed forward the struggle for different sections of workers during the last two years. The movement rapidly developed into a mass democratic experience where, uh, where we uh, occupied the squares for three months, which required a very high level of organization from people that was not uh, politicized at, at the beginning. The squares will have assemblies of thousands of people, and this showed that making decisions on a democratic basis was completely possible to make decisions for the next demonstration or to organize protests. The direct democracy of the assemblies and the protests give us terrific confidence in taking action. We knew as an activist that we had to take advantage of this confidence. It's important to say that the occupations of the square were not seen as an end in themselves, but were seen as a forming a new form of organization that could end austerity measures or help to end them by, by working class sections of the precarious and also uh, the classic working class. Of course, this was not an isolated movement, but a global movement of different levels, the Egyptian Revolution, the Greece, Turkey, Brazil, us linking this movement and getting the working people involved in this process was an achievement in itself for the movement. During the downtown of the movement, many, many activists joined different organizations, platforms and movements like the anti-eviction movement. In this movement, we felt the influence on, of M15 because of the direct action way it developed to stop the evictions. And watching the way this is spread all over the state, this movement led to the government making some legislative changes, but most importantly, it was not any council that was able to stop these evictions, but the direct action of the movement. The last two general strikes that we had in the Spanish state, in comparison of the first, were fantastic, supporting people from the unions and organizing committees. The last general strike, which involved up to 9 million people, also had a social feeling, which actually increased the impact and organized blocks from the movement at, at the center of it. We had different committees in different neighborhoods from um, people uh, helping uh, to close different uh, companies different call centers that maybe they don't have a tradition of, uh, of being united. And we, we, we socialize this, uh, this help in these workplaces uh, using these 15M structures. The public sector has also uh, been very influenced by the movement. Teachers and hospital workers being in direct, in direct contact with the people with the teacher strikes in Mallorca, we saw them making similar assemblies for the discussion to organize themselves, which mirrored the 15M movement. And this is the influence of the M15 over some sections of workers. The reality is that all 
Although that we have seen some important localized vectors with indefinite strikes in uh, Hewlett Packard in Catalonia and the refuse workers in Madrid and the huge two million demonstration in Madrid, there has not been enough pressure put from below to push the unions into fine fighting back the, 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 the main trade unions. Even though the Spanish ruling class is winning the battle, the situation is quite fragile from the anger of the people. The majority of people are saying that they don't want to have any more token strikes, but a strike or movement that will be effective. The, this anger also manifests itself in the riots after the demonstrations, which are getting larger and larger, confronting the police more and more. We are seeking how to the political institutional pillars of the Spanish state are passing through historical crisis. The classics parties are eroding and suffering a strong disaffection coming from the people. Present polls show that in 210, 70, 70 of 70 percent, sorry, my English with numbers is a little bit, uh, 70 percent of people felt that Spain was a democratic country. In two, uh, 2007, we have 70 percent of support for the European Union, while now we have 72 percent of people saying that they do not trust the European Union. The two main political parties at 50 percent in the polls, which give the left at the moment, opportunities to create new alternatives like Podemos or Coup in Catalonia and take advantage of this political disaffection, but also give the ruling class important questions like who they will put to install more austerity measures like a new coalition. <laughs> also, another strong institution coming out of the transitional process, the monarchy is losing a lot of support, caught up alone with the politicians, caught up in corruption, corruption scandals. We are having a strong national liberation movement in Catalonia, which is eroding the institutions of the Spanish state. We will have a votation about the independence next November, as you know. The European Union was a very important thing coming out of the transition to the democracy process and, ha and now people are seeking clearly that the European Union is only applying austerity measures. So uh, in Gram Gramsci terms we can say that we are facing a hegemony crisis. This is not my words, they are, these are the words of comrades that, uh, in, in Catalonia that uh, we have been talking about that and um, about the hegemony crisis. Uh, with the ruling class, finding it hard to maintain an ideological control over, the, over their own consensus. We have seen how the rich people in Spain, the millionaires, have grown by 5%, while the working class people are getting poorer and poorer. So why are we so far from creating a counter regime? We have a very fragmented left in Spain, we are paying a very high price for not getting the unity over the past few, few, few years. The radical left was small and unable to create a post for the movement, and we are paying a high, a high price for this. We need to take advantage all of, all, of all this political disaffection by offering alternatives. We also need activists connecting this social upheaval with the working class movements. We have the conditions to create a middle term, long term resistance in the Spanish state. And we are seeking how, when they are launched, they are winning a lot of support. La CUP, the anti capitalist party, has managed, managed to enter into the parliament with 3.5% of the vote. And David Fernandez in the polls was the second favorite politician in Catalonia. This is really, really good and shows that the people are looking for alternatives of radical reforms. Another very new initiative is Podemos, which has radical anti-capitalist programs and will be running for the European elections.
now we've got this here, he's an Italian activist and writer on the relevance of Marxist capitalism. Hello. Um, in my speak today, in my talk today, I'll try to present a global political economy analysis of the crisis in Western Europe. And as it is well known, the crisis is determining a dramatic increase in the number of unemployed, precarious workers and working poor. Uh, this is affecting especially hard-hit countries uh, in Southern Europe, like uh, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. But uh, it's also the case in uh, richer countries like uh, Germany and the UK. So from this map, I, I can't really go into details, but we can see that uh, unemployment levels at the EU level have reached un unprecedented inter-country differences, and they ranged from the 28-27% in Spain and uh, Greece to 13% in Italy and 5% in Germany. In the last three years, these are two graphs that show the development of real wages in the EU between 2001 and 2009, and then from 2010 to 2012. And you can see uh, that in the last three years, uh, real wages only nominally increased in Germany, while they declined by more than 3% in Italy and the UK, by almost 7% in Portugal and Spain, and by 23% in Greece. In 2012, according to Eurostat, almost one-fourth of the EU15 population, so nearly 92 million people, including people in work, was at risk of poverty and social exclusion, and this was uh, 8.5 million people more than in 2007. From my point of view, these processes are not a temporary aberration that will eventually and peacefully come to an end with the all good times coming back. But these processes of impoverishment express an underlying trend towards impoverishment that is inherent to the capitalist mode of production. And uh, in this uh, talk, I will try to prove that the crisis is uh, uh, expressing uh, the law of impoverishment that is defined by Marx in Capital as the general, general absolute law of a capitalist accumulation. And I will finally draw some conclusions on the prospects uh, for working class resistance. So very briefly, for Marx, impoverishment is on the one side a precondition for the creation of the working class, which presupposes a continuous process of dispossession of independent producers. And uh, it is, on the other side, a necessary result of the production of wealth as capital. Accumulation, in fact, tends towards a progressive uh, polarization between relative wealth and poverty, which hasn't uh, to be confused with the impoverishment in absolute terms of the working class as an undifferentiated whole. So, uh, increasing uh, productivity doesn't aim at uh, improving living standards and reducing their work time, but it aims at increasing labor exploitation. And, uh, and so it aims at decreasing uh, the relative wage, which expresses the difference between the value produced and the value appropriated by workers. Crucially, um, impoverishment in this way is not synonymous with extreme poverty, because the relative wage can decrease even though uh, the real wage, so in terms of uh, consumption level, uh, levels can, uh, even if uh, the real wage increases. And uh, the negative effects of the la wage labor condition, moreover, uh, don't, uh, are not limited to the workplace, but they extend to the reproduction process as a whole. For Marx, moreover, impoverishment is uh, inherently an international process, as uh, accumulation is. And the difficulties provoked by the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, and so the relative reduction in the role of living labor in the production of real wealth, uh, forces capital to increase labor exploitation to the utmost. And this is realized also through the internationalization of production 
and the expansion of the industrial reserve army of unemployed and underemployed, uh, which is exploitable through migration or international investment. So uh, the global industrial reserve army um, plays a fundamental role in uh, capitalist production because it creates the condition for the compression of wages and puts pressure on the employed population. In this way, uh, in this way also because of the low level of wages, employed workers are forced to lengthen, to lengthen the working day, thus further reducing the demand for labor power and enhancing or in increasing the labor reserve army. So this is a kind of vicious circle of unemployment and uh, uh, super exploitation that Marx analyzed from my point of view already at the international level. And, uh, and that's why accumulation uh, causes the impoverishment of the global working class despite and through the differentiation of the condition of the national sectors of the working class. Since the outbreak of the crisis of uh, profitability in the mid-70s, these mechanisms have been clearly at work. And they have been at work even more clearly than in the post-war period. On the one side, neoliberal policies have announced the process of uh, rural dispossession and migration in the countryside, in the, in the global south, and also in the former Soviet bloc. And they have expanded, if not doubled, the Global Reserve <laughs> Army of Labor at uh, the global level. On the other side, the global restructuring of industrial production has undermined the colonial division of labor between producers of raw materials in the global south and the industrial producers in the north. And this has generalized international competition at the international, international competition also in the industrial sectors. Since the mid 70s, almost uh, this is, yes, this is a, a, a graph from the International Labour Organization that shows that since the mid 70s, the industrial working class in the global south has uh, rapidly outgrown uh, that in the north, up to the point that almost, um, um, yes, that uh, almost 80% of the glo global industrial workforce now lives in southern countries. And uh, in um, 2010, some 2.4 billion people belonged to the Global Industrial Reserve Army of Labor. And there were an estimated uh, 942 million working poor, nearly one in uh, three workers uh, worldwide, who live below the uh, $2 uh, poverty, level, poverty line. <laughs> so these processes, from my point of view, are, are extreme importance for understanding the crisis in the uh, European Union. Because uh, on the one side, we, we need to take into account that the process of EU integration has been characterized by increased capital flows to low-wage countries and increasing immigration from low-wage low countries. And in this process, uh, northern member states have progressively specialized in capital intensive production or services, while southern European member states have uh, specialized in uh, low capital intensive production. And uh, these overall transformations also resulted in a substantial increase in unemployment, which was only initially compensated by the expansion of the so called service sector and by the growth of a typical precarious employment. At the same time, restrictive and selective migration policies have produced illegality and a differential racist system of rights, rendering immigrant uh, workers, hyper-precarious workers, forced to make every sacrifice in order to stay in the country. By fostering the stratification and the division among workers, immigration policies have aimed at uh, incre or making difficult the common organization between, uh, between workers. At the same time, we have seen that uh, the demo social democratic trade union strategies have been largely ineffective in front of these transformations and against reforms reducing the scope for trade union activity and promoting precarity, workfare, and privatization. The resulting increase in low pay, wage inequalities, and poverty 
did not only affect the kind of precarious sector or the poor workers in the working class, but they have affected the working class as a whole. And in fact, in the neoliberal period, we have witnessed a general um, reduction in the um, in the share of uh, wages in relation to GDP, which shows that workers have appropriated a declining uh, share of the value they have produced. These processes have been registered first in the UK and only later in countries like Germany and Italy, but we can really see that this is a kind of general uh, trend. And confirming Marx's analysis of the relationship between poverty, low wages, and unemployment and uh, labor exploitation, we have seen that in the neoliberal period, a growing proportion of workers have been forced into increasingly long and unequally distributed working hours. In all branches of social organization, moreover, work has been intensified and has become more stressful, insecure, and harmful. So, in order to understand the root causes of the crisis, I think we need to look at this uh, process and its contradiction, contradictions both at, uh, from an economic point of view and from a social political point of view. Because despite a brutal attack on working conditions work worldwide, we have seen that um, the rate of profit uh, has not uh, returned to the level of the Second World War. And uh, on the other side, we have seen that, especially since the end of the 90s, Western imperialism has in encountered increasing social opposition and resistance from Latin America to Afghanistan and Iraq to um, the uh, Asia, where the rise of the new labor movement is acknowledged by, also by the Financial Times. So I think that um, another point that needs to be taken into account is that the internationalization of industrial production has laid the condition for the, create, the growth of new centers of accumulation. And um, China in particular is um, kind of rising the value chain and is uh, putting increasing pressure on um, European, the European industrial sector not only in low-tech production, but also in high-tech manufacturing. And this explains why the crisis is hitting so harshly the EU industrial sector, where nearly 4 million jobs have been lost since the outbreak of the uh, global economic crisis. And also, uh, yes, and also, this also explains why southern member states are so harshly affected by the crisis. So, why? Because of the processes I described, uh, described earlier, southern member states are, have a, a production uh, levels which are concentrated in the lower range of uh, technology. And so uh, studies on, um, on the export complexity have shown that they increasingly compete with the emerging markets. And so if we include uh, Brazil, India, and China in the range of countries considered as competitors, the um, compet competitiveness of the EU manufacturing is lower than uh, if uh, we don't uh, take them into account. And so I think that this analysis also sheds light on the main goal of austerity policies, which is not just to reduce kind of public spending, but it is to support competitiveness and profitability by cutting government spending, reducing welfare-related benefits, extending the privatization process, and generalizing precarious working conditions, thus creating the conditions for increase, increasing labor exploitation in workplaces. So what are the consequences of this analysis in terms of strategy and uh, organization? The first point I'd like to underline is the centrality of labor, labor power, for understanding uh, this crisis. Labor is at the center of the attack, and workers have to be the center and the lead of the resistance. After years and years in which we heard discourses 
on the, the multitudes, the end of the working class, and the civil disobedience, the crisis has laid the basis for the emergence of a potentially stronger movement which is rooted in workplace resistance. And especially in the Western European countries, hit most by the crisis as the comrade was discussing, working class, public sector and unemployed workers have taken up the struggle and they have played a central role in the movements inside or outside the main trade union organizations. And they also draw inspiration, drew inspiration from <laughs> the Arab uprisings and the movement in the global south. The second point I want to stress is the systemic and international character of this crisis, which is exposing the structural antagonisms of the capitalist mode of production and the strict link, the close connection between processes of impoverishment in the south and in the north. And the response to the crisis, therefore, from my point of view, has been as a systemic and international as the crisis we are facing. And uh, I think that this has been, and this still, a major weakness of both the social movements and also the radical left parties in Europe. Up to today, in fact, attempts to coordinate at the European level have been largely unsuccessful. The rise of Syriza in Greece, moreover, has strengthened the idea of building a government of the left, of the centre-left, and then uh, you don't know where you can arrive, really. Uh, I think that this is not a just a subjective limit, but it's a kind of necessary um, result of the current situation, because in times of crisis like the present one, the, sp the prospect of assuming government without the program of radical break with capitalism necessarily leads to moderation and retreats, dispersing the potential for struggle existing among the working class and leaving room for the far right, as uh, for example the election is in France have uh, also proved. So the labor and social movements that have emerged in Western Europe against the crisis, however, however, have shown the necessity and also the possibility of developing forms of power that are alternative to institutional politics. In order to advance in these struggles, workers need to oppose the logic of competitiveness and imperialism and to strengthen their independent political organizations. Nanit's perspective on the international revolution, therefore, from my point of view, is still of relevance today. And imperialist struggles are not external to resistance in uh, Europe, but they are part and parcel of one and the same struggle. And um, only such an imperial, anti-imperialist perspective, moreover, allows us to substantiate processes of solidarity building between native-born and immigrant workers at the national level. <coughs> and I'd like to conclude by making just one of the, an example of this. It's true, now liberalism act has attacked, uh, uh, labor has uh, profoundly um, worsened the situation of the working class, but it has also created new potentialities for struggles. For example, let's see the effects of uh, immigration in Western European countries that has transformed the working class and made it really a multinational working class. Also in Southern uh, European states where immigration is a relatively new process. Just to make an example, in Italy between 2001 and 2011, the number of immigrant workers who are members of the main trade union has risen by one million people. So you see that this is enormous potential for struggles, and I think that it is why an anti-imperialist, anti-racist perspective is not something that we can postpone to a second, part, second level of the struggle, but must inform our resistance. <laughs> Um, in everyday struggle because it's a condition for strengthening the working class at the national, regional and at the international level. Thank you. Thank you. And finally we've got Pura, who is the branch and regional chair of Magnet UCD. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I've been asked to come and talk about my experiences as a trade unionist and the kinds of things that we've been doing in terms of organising against um, um, neoliberalism and the attacks that we've suffered in education. And I, have to, I think that I can only speak from my experiences. 
But I think that in what I tell you about what we've been going through, there's many, many examples, many, many concrete examples of what people have been talking about. And I'm going to talk about what neoliberalism, I think, actually feels like in the workplace. And I'm going to be talking about ways of organising within trade unions to fight against the double whammy, or triple whammy, actually, is neoliberalism, which is economic attack, the ideological attacks, and the attacks on trade unions. I want to talk, first of all, about what neoliberalism looks like to work at, I work in higher education, so I'm from Houston University and College Union, um, and I want to talk about what it looks like in education. I think, first of all, for um, members of UCU, but also for students as well, <coughs> is what we see is the application of the most crude business model to education, where you see that every single area of university life is subjected to the drive for profit, and in fact, it's profit or bust, which was, um, I think it was, um, I don't think it was said, but you know, the changes to the funding at universities, and what they said was, what the Tories were saying was, well, they can either be profitable or they can go to the wall in the same sense as any other business, and that's what they've got to do. Okay? So if you combine the slashing of funding to higher education, and at the same time, the removal of any idea of caps or quotas of students, you can see that every single, um, every single educational institution is constantly and permanently in a state of open competition with every other institution and constantly in a state of open competition for attracting more investment, private investment, for making themselves more attractive to private investors and for attracting more students who of course have all been um, reconfigured as customers. And what, one of the things that you can see in universities is that there is actually, as a result of this enormous increase in student fees, uh, the second highest in the world now, I believe, there is actually a huge amount of money washing around in universities. And you can see that universities quite clearly are investing this money, and what they're investing it in quite clearly is things to attract their customers. So you might have, for example, I talk about my place, in my place, for example, with the fancy plants, because they planted an indoor, an indoor garden, which I think is very expensive to, to keep up. Fancy plants and carpets and art and refurbishing full refurbishing of buildings which they know are about to be demolished. I don't want to sound completely ignorant. I'm not against fancy plants or carpets or nice <laughs> artwork and all the rest of it. But when you're doing that at the expense of investing in the people and their expertise and the experience of people like myself who are actually there who can actually build education, which is what these institutions are supposed to be about, that's when you've got a serious problem and that's what we're seeing. If I think about it from students' point of view, for example, I think the pernicious aspects of neoliberalism are particularly dangerous because it's a smashing of the idea of the student as a thinker or an innovator or a contributor or as the future of education and the replacement with the idea of the student not just as a consumer but as a passive consumer, somebody who's just going to be the passive recipient of something. And you can see the way that the language is used which is the language of business and the language of products. So they use, for example, um, and they talk about, for example, they talk about delivering a lecture, and they talk about as if it's something which is pre-made and pre-packaged. And all I'm going to do as a lecturer is bring it along, put it on the table, put it out there. And uh, and of course, the other thing that they do extensively is talk about the importance of the student experience. So that's the student experience. Um, which is something, we can, an expression we come across all the time. The student experience, obviously, at the expense of education, which is what we used to talk about for students. And of course, the reality is that the student experience is looking forward to a lifetime of debt, with some <laughs> irony in the fact that they're applying the market model to education at the time of the biggest market crisis that there has been for over a generation. But this is the model which has been visited on education and on students. And so from that, I think, the idea of what neoliberalism means for education, because it's not just an economic attack, but the pernicious imposition of the business model in, a change, in an attempt to change what it is that we understand by education. What do we think education really is? What do we think it's for? Who do we think is involved in it? And who do we think benefits from it? And, I mean, it's not just the Tories white paper on education, which has absolutely no reference whatsoever to the public value of education. But you can see here a very, very different idea of education to what our education, our idea of education is about. So, for example, the Tories can only see education as something which is a private purchase for private gain. So the student is seen as being important to the extent that they can write out the cheque 
and pay for what it is that they are experiencing, the student experience that they're getting at university. And the idea that, that education per se is something which benefits us all and benefits society and in fact is the driver for change and advance and progress in society is an idea which is being smashed under neoliberalism. And I mean, like I say, I am talking from my own experiences. I hope that you can see that they're extendable to other areas of the public sector and public services. But I have to talk about, you know, the ones which I, I mean, the ones which I know about. I want to talk a little bit about what the experience is for the worker, for somebody who works in education, to have. A, one of the aspects, for example, is the imposition of a very, very crude corporate model of working relations. That's where you get the expressions, for example, we talk openly now about line managers. We never used to talk about line managers in, the, in educational institutions. I mean, I work now in HE, and I previously was a school teacher. That's what my background is. And so those are the areas of education that I've been working. We never used to have words like line managers. Sometimes you talked about your head of department, often you talked about colleagues, and there was some sort of idea that everybody was had a role to play, and it was an, everybody had an important, vital role, not just an equal role, but everybody had a vital role to play. But this line management that we've now got um, in schools as well, it, it, what it does is it sets up endless daily targets and quotas and things which you have to meet. And so your work is absolutely undermined by meeting this target and that other target with an endless bureaucratic um, systems. I mean, I think that the the NSS, the National Student Survey, which if you're a student, you definitely know about, is one of the most crude, crude um, examples of this. I mean, it's set up, it's conducted in a way which, you know, with the grace of the, the, the work, quite frankly, of a GCSE social studies student. And yet this is something which is used very much as a want to beat people with. And I'm going to talk now about bullying and the increase, this massive increase that you see in bullying at work, where I've known, for example, members who've just been shouted at. Three students have said that they don't like your lectures. What are you going to do about it? And they put on the massive um, monitoring. In fact, in, I've got somebody now who's had where management are trying to force um, observations of lectures. Observations of lectures is something which is quite contentious and we don't allow them to be enforced in that way. And also, of, of, of um, people telling me stories where they've been told things like, well, don't upset the students too much. You know, not quite said they're customers, we don't want to piss them off, but that's what the, the feeling is. Don't tell them. Look, just ask them what they want you to teach and just teach them that. Right? Now, in a different context, actually, I quite like that. So I'm not completely, it's not that I'm saying that I'm against that, because in a different context, I'd like to have that sort of relationship with students. At the other, uh, on the other hand, you can see that if somebody is going for simple and immediate gains, that's not a basis for, for students. If they're going for a simple, uh, um, a, 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 you know, instrumental gain from what they're getting, that's not the way to go. Um, the other thing, and all of this, I think, links back to the other speakers that we've had about what neoliberalism is about. I mean, the huge increase in workload, I can't tell you how much, the increase in workload in higher education. I mean, the recent survey said that a third of us now are working over a 50-hour week. But the thing that worries me about it is that the increase from last year is one and a half hours per week. Now, if that's the increase from last year, one and a half hours per week, you can see that's, again, which is simply not sustainable. Another, uh, another one minute left. Right. Okay, I wanted to talk as well. About the um, about the effect of neoliberalism on trade unions, because I, I do want to have a minute to talk about the disputes that we've had and the fight back that, that UCU has put on. But I also want to say, and this relates to things that other comrades were saying before, the employer is bringing on confrontations with unions, and that's quite clear. If you look, for example, at the dispute that we had, the fight back and dispute that we had over pensions, and the one that UCU <laughs> has now, which is overpay, they're not primarily economically driven. There isn't an economic case for, for, for the pensions and tax which there have been. And actually in higher education, there is a very weak economic case for holding our wages down to the extent that they have been. Um, a UCU um, um, estimate thinks that because of the rise in tuition fees, the amount of surplus that there currently is in the higher education sector is probably in the range of £1 billion. Mm. That is a pretty huge surplus, and the pro economic projections say that it's likely to grow. And so the confrontations that they're having with us over pensions and over pay, so I'm just going to put in here that our pay 
has decreased by about 15% over five years as a result of one below inflation um, thing after another. But the confrontations that they're bringing on with us are quite clearly politically driven, and they're politically driven because basically what they're saying is they want to see us up against it, and they want to know who's going to win. They want to, they're, they're attacking us in this way because they want, uh, they want to bank on us not fighting, and in us not fighting, what is at stake here is much more than the, uh, than the issues which are over pensions and pay, but the whole idea of trade unions being able to fight back, being able to collectivise, and of course the whole idea of national bargaining, and of course that's what the teachers were out last week on Wednesday, etc, etc. I just want to spend a little bit talking about resistance. UCU, for a very small union, or one of the smallest unions, has actually played a pivotal role. If you look at the trajectory, I, I usually start on the trajectory about 2009, because that's when the students were demonstrating in France um, over pensions. And I very much remember in 2009 having a meeting with students and us saying, look at the potential. And the students at that point, this is a student exec, of the student union. The student exec at that point saying, well, they're doing that because they're French and it wouldn't happen here and there's something different about being French which means that you're more likely to take the streets to demonstrate with pensioners about the future of pensions, which I thought was interesting, I did something very interesting. Um, and of course that was just before 2010 and then you got 2010 and then you got 2011. And the big, big, big run up which there was in uh, up to the um, public sector strike on the 30th of November, which I probably can't go into, but UCU has played a very interesting and pivotal role, I think, for a very small union. And part of that is that we have had a tactic of standing people, standing left candidates for uh, for elections. We did get people onto the NEC, and I think that that's something that's a, which, which actually needs to be discussed much more than we can here, um, the whole issue of standing left candidates and where it leaves us in terms of having left positions, but where it leaves us in terms of building the rank and file, which at the end of the day has to be our strategy. Anyway, what I want to talk about is the traditions of resistance, which we've had recently in, um, in the uh, fight back that we've had, and we've been on strike again. I just received my pay packet in the last month. I was four days of pay because I wanted in one of our minority of um, employers that docked us 100% um, pay for a two-hour stoppage, Ooh. as a result of which I lost four days pay in one month, and so have all my members, but as a result of which our branch was one of the tiny minority which voted to escalate that action, and we said, you're not paying us, we're not going into work, against the advice of our union leadership. Our union general secretary wrote to us and said, even though you're not getting paid, you should go back into work, and our members said, that's exactly what we're not going to do. One of the things that we've seen is, I think, reconnecting with traditions of solidarity that it's been a long time since we've seen. And I think, just to finish on this, the re what has been important about the struggles that we've raised, waged is the way that we've been able to link the ideological attacks on education, on students, and what they mean, with the trade disputes that we've had over paying pensions. And for the future, that's the key. We've worked in UCU, we've worked particularly well with students. I was at a student meeting just on Wednesday, and there were about 20 students there, all planning the launch of the next stage in our um, in our campaign, which is a marking boycott. And that is absolutely superb, because a marking boycott for students is very rarely welcomed. It's quite hard to argue, it's a hard argument to have with students that a marking boycott is ultimately going to be in their interest. And I think that in terms of the future, in terms of fighting back and defending the public sector, an area that we've got to look at far more, and we've got to think about how we operate in, is how do we marry up the ideological attacks of neoliberalism with the economic attacks of neoliberalism, and how do we combine the, our campaigns so that in our campaigns we have a combination of workers who are affected by the changes but, are the, but have the industrial strength, and those people who benefit from the public services, and we need to bring those into the campaign and make stronger joint campaigns in order to take them forward. Thanks very much. Uh, if anyone's got any questions or contributions, just raise your hand. Um, it would probably be best if you can come down here, but if you're miles away, like a few people are, we've got a roving mic, which Sahil's going to bring round to people. Don, can you press the um, thing on the side? Yeah. 
So maybe we'll go with um, Roderick first, and then I'll take everyone's. I'll take everyone's name down as you put your hands up. Okay. Um, yeah, and the key point is related to the Okay, fine. Okay, fine. So I think I think, 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 uh, Milbank was also, I think, partly inspired by things like the impact of the Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, and, and so on. And you can see similar things in the Arab Spring itself. In Egypt, for example, the, um, the Malhalla strikes, one of the key inspirations for the revolution, which in turn reinforced and galvanized the trade movement to actually uh, to complete the revolution. Um, and also in Spain, where the, where the, um, the, 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 the movement there helped to galvanize the trade unions also. Now, I think. This, this has an impact on practice that we actually need to, to do because one of the things that was very common in the when I was in the SWP was there was a tendency to see that you need to bring the trade unions into the movement to give the movement that kind of working class sort of political edge. Whereas I think right now the real militancy by and large is not actually in the trade unions. So I mean there are some sparks, but it's by and large the biggest militancy in this country and elsewhere is in the, is in the, is in the social movements. We need to bring the social movement into the trade union movement so that the workers can actually see that militancy and the power of those movements in action and be inspired by that in the way that the, that the Spanish trade union movements have been galvanized by the, by the movement in, in Spain. That means we have to do things like making sure that if we're in a local in a, in a trade union branch, that branch is signing up to the campaign, that members are going along to the campaign and getting involved in them, um, and then we're doing things like bringing the speakers from, from, from the social movement, including international ones if we can. Into, into, to speak to trade union members and, and so on, and, and that we can actually get um, get that sense of the, of, of the movement into the trade union movement because it's not just, I mean, movements now are a priority for us, I think, partly because of the ease in which, as, as Neil said, um, for workers to get involved in them when it's difficult to get involved in, in things in the workplace, but also because they influence the trade union movement and they, they galvanize and energize the movements um, in a way that we really need. Um, and that's what I've got to say. This one? Uh, hello, yeah. Um, I, I was also involved in the Indignados movement in Spain when I was living in Barcelona. And uh, I just want to add a, a couple of points about the relationship between neoliberalism and this movement. Um, and, and, and think about you know what is the nature of this movement. And I think that there's been a lot of things said on the left about the Indignados movement, that it was just a response to austerity, or, or that it was an autonomous movement, or that even, and someone who might be in this room now was arguing the other day that it was a social democratic movement. And actually, I think that you know really these failed to actually identify what is the kind of fundamental dynamic that brought people out onto the streets in 2011. I think the main key thing is, and, and, and you can see this by looking at when this, actually, this struggle actually starts, is that it's just before the May elections in 2011 when people felt there was absolutely no one to vote for because all the parties are actually you know, are, are defending the same things. So you have the socialist government in power, applying neoliberal politics as if it were a right-wing party, and people just said, these, part, these politicians don't represent us. That was the slogan of the movement. Of course, people were angry about austerity, and that was, that was you know, behind the rejection of the political establishment. But, you know, there's been a theory developed by people like Tad Tietze and, and Elizabeth Humphreys that these movements are kind of anti-politics movement, which doesn't mean that the people in them don't have political ideas. What it means is a rejection of politics as we know it. And that, that actually, I know there's a discussion about this, so if I'm trampling on, uh, on the discussion tomorrow, but, you know, that clearly was the, the fundamental kind of driving force behind the movement. 
And I think that's absolutely important to grasp, because then we can understand the potential of this movement. A movement that actually doesn't see parliamentary struggle as an option where we actually control our institutions, we therefore control society, but actually sees it as the enemy, that actually sees it as a ruling class, yeah, trying to rule over us, is an absolutely important historical development. In Britain, we're seeing how when Russell Brand talks about politi politics in the same way, and you get this massive you know, reaction in support of him, you see that the mood is here in Britain as well. In, in, Sp in the Spanish state, that actually developed into a, a movement, which, as Medea said, was really exciting because of the kind of radical way it organized and the sense of struggle in that movement. It was also important, I think, because it's actually um, it's opened up new opportunities. We mentioned that there are new, you know, left move movements that are standing in the elections now, and they're doing so in a very different way from the way social democracy operates. It's actually seeing institutions as something we want to get in to block the neoliberal parties because there's been all these struggles in the last few years, like the massive anti-eviction campaign, but they haven't managed to actually force through radical change. Now people are saying, we actually want to take power in some way or another. There's all sorts of discussions about how to do that. There's some quite sort of reformist elements within these news projects actually arguing for all sorts of unhealthy alliances, and there's, there's massive debates about the, the way forward. But what really is exciting is we're now seeing a new left emerge with all sorts of discussions which revolutionaries could intervene in, and which actually does not trust in institutional politics, actually wants to fight for, for kind of the social movements to run society, but to actually get in the institution and actually, um, you know, kind of to, to, to try and enable that, that process to come about. There's more things I could have said, maybe I'll, I'll say it in the, in the meeting tomorrow, but that is absolutely exciting development. You can't just kind of put down by saying these people are reformists or autonomous. Um, I've got Yeah, I mean, I wanted to talk about the way that the conception that people have of how to change society is different. I mean, when I grew up, I think, you know, when all people of my age grew up, we were in a world where socialism was largely conceived of as being to do with the Soviet Union. And even for those of us who never believed that that was what we meant by socialism, I do think that the collapse of the Eastern Bloc has meant that it has taken away from many people the idea that some kind of different world is possible, so that all that is left is happening. So one of the issues is how do we begin to conceive of a different kind of world? What, um, how would we actually talk about that if we're actually going to fight for that? Because it's very clear from the struggles that people have talked about in Spain and, and in other places, and Russell Brand and so on, that there is huge anger and scepticism and hatred of the ruling class and so on. But it's how do we begin to conceive of some kind of generalized alternative? And, and how do we start to, prove it, to, prove it, to present the ideas of Marx? And I would say the experience of the October Revolution and all of that tradition, um, you know, not in some kind of historical reenactment kind of way, but actually how can we draw those experiences and make them relevant um, to the situation today? I think, you know, that those are some of the crucial tasks that we face. The vital issue there is how do we organize? Because, I mean, I'm interested to hear from the Spanish government, but my understanding um, is that in the squares, or at least in some of the squares, there was a ban on political parties. Because people are, you know, understandably, looking on the one hand the Tories, and on the other hand the way that social democrats have sold out struggles across Europe. You can understand why people would have that skepticism about political parties, but also having that skepticism about Marxist parties. And on the basis of that scepticism, how do we begin to organize for socialism? And again, how do we reinterpret um, the experiences and the lessons of the last 150 years of struggle and make those something fresh and new and, uh, and, and make that something relevant to the political situation that we face today? Because I think if you actually look back at something like October 1970, I mean, that is something which is brought about by young people, which is about new ideas, which is about debate within the movement and so on. Um, you know, so I think that you know, those are things that are things that are relevant, but how do we rephrase them and represent them for now? Thanks, Colin. Um, okay, I've got something to do you want to come on? Do you want to come to the microphone? Just so <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question to the uh, UCU comrade. Um, in terms of the pay dispute, there's obviously four unions involved in that, and um, it, it was so that was you know UCU, but also United Nimson and EIS, and the other three have kind of fallen off in terms of the market work. So just do that. Um, but I've had a lot of people in Unison in particular, because I'm involved in Unison, um, <laughs> asking how do they actually support that. And so I was wondering if you could give us a few pointers, because we do want to support that. Um, and it's obviously a campaign that affects everyone, but there's nothing they can do in terms of actually boycotting the market, because they don't want So that was it, really. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, I just want to push people on three points or key questions. It's not a good idea if everyone kind of agrees with each other. Um, I think <laughs> the first one is, do you think the crisis is still going on? It seems obvious to me that in the terms of the trough of crisis of capitalism, it's past it. And that leaves us with the question then of why is it at that, at that level, a specific punctuated kind of thing, um, it's the left that's in bits and not the ideology of the liberals. So what did we get wrong? What are we responsible for that we kind of reach this state? I think um, to add a bit or develop something Neil said, just reflects on the comrade familiar experience of the utterly evil bullshit um, that's going on in the universe at the moment, is I think actually without a countervailing force of labor, capitalism in some sense starting to eat itself start to undermine the conditions of its own reproduction. Now, do we want demands that defend capital against itself, or are we going to try and accelerate the contradiction? I think that's something people should consider, discuss. Um, secondly, on the nature of what's happening in kind of revolutionary movements and so on, I mean, my, my experience of particularly Egypt and Brazil is that the revolutionary subject and the working class are not identical, far from even saying that the trade union and trade unions and the working class and revolution subject are identical. Not only that, but these actors don't exist before the events. So the people, this collective body that's forced through the Egyptian revolution, it wasn't there except in kind of embryo before January 2011. So you have to think about what it is that is going to be the trajectories for that to exist. Which leads me on to the last thing, which I want I mean, I think Neil's a bit hard on the Foucault kind of position, but let's leave that aside. But I think one of the most, the best contributions of Italian work, for example, particularly Mario Conti, is the idea of the political composition of the working class and the technical composition of the working class. The technical composition being your kind of, both what you do at work, how you do it, who you're related to, but also the cultural and physical infrastructures in which the working class operates, which have been completely reduced and atomized. Um, and that, then poses the question of what they call the political composition of the working class. So it's action against capital right, as a kind of agent. Surely we have to be looking for something that matches what is currently the technical composition of the working class, rather than trying to aspire to a pre-existing um, Okay, and Rachel? Um, words really about neoliberalism and women and the effect that neoliberalism has had on women. I think increasingly neoliberalism has taken things that we used to manage collectively, such as care of the elderly, care of the disabled, and care of children, and has taken that and it's become an individual, so an individual's family responsibility. So increasingly women have been, have been forced really to take care of elderly relatives. Recently, people may have seen the study that showed that the price of um, childcare per month was something like six hundred and fifty pounds. That's a third of my wage. If I can put my kid into a nursery, that's a third of my wage. In fact, when I had to put my kid into nursery full time and then pay to transport, I'm looking at half of my wage going out before I even get to work. I work for the NHS. I'm not going to be getting any pay. I won't be paid to go to work. See, it kind of feels like. But I think increasingly we need to talk about, in fact, how we can come up with kind of collective sort of solutions. So obviously, at one thing we need to argue against the incredible high prices that people have to pay for childcare. We need to argue for 
um, free care for elderly people. We need to argue against the cuts and closures of day centres. But we need to manage it in such a collective way. I think lots of people feel that they are really very alone when they're arguing these things and when they're managing these things. And I think it's one of the things that we probably need to be involved in. in all, all through the movement, we need to be talking about the role of women and how it's hard for women to get involved because of these cares and these burdens that they have. Um, just to think that I just sort of talk about the role of women under neoliberalism as being one of maybe our key things that we need to start theorising about. Thanks. Um, next up, Rachel, could you just pass the mic to him? Let's have a China. You can bring the mic around. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hi. Right, um, so it seems to me that one of our starting points has to be really the key question is the extent to which we do recognise this as a specific moment with specific characteristics that are more important, more structural than simply the particularities of our own uh, workplace issues and so on, which are always going to be there and there's always going to be fight back. This is this is this is uncontroversial because if we simply focus on those, then there is a danger of essentially <coughs> going from campaign to campaign, if you like, without an overarching sense of the specificity of this moment of particular uh, accumulation regime, extraordinary, brutal, ongoing, weaponized atomization, uh, disempowerment, and collapse of social horizon. And to that extent, I want to ask, I want to ask um, two of the presenters questions. I want to ask Neil, and I want to ask Lucia. Now, it seems to me that, Neil, one of the key and most important things that you said uh, was your point about the shift towards a sort of direct rule by business, and that this is a problem Capital for the ruling class, um, uh, as well as leading to some of the, um, the, the kind of baleful consequences that we see around us, and that, that is possibly likely to accelerate. I wanted to ask you um, whether or not you thought uh, where this was going, whether or not you think there is a ruling class strategy to deal with this, whether it is perceived as a problem among certain, certain groups of the ruling class. It seems to me clearly it is, but the question of what they're going to do about it is new. Um, and finally, what the ramifications of that. Uh, kind of more direct rule, if you like, are for working class and radical strategy. And this dovetails to some extent with Jamie's point about possibly some of the things that we might be able to do are accelerate contradictions rather than fight very about battles that may have already been lost. The second question I wanted to ask was, um, you know, now, what I liked very much about the, 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 the talk was the recognition that this is, if you like, new time. This is a specific new moment. Um, and the analysis of that, of, of, of that kind of novelty, I think, is really important. Um, but after the kind of the, 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 the analytic, which I, I found very useful and, and persuasive, then there were a couple of phrases you said. I may have misquoted you, but you know that this new situation lays the basis for a new central role for workers and creates new potentialities for struggle. Now, I wonder if this is a banality. Any new situation creates new potentialities for struggle. There are new ways of fighting back. The key question is whether it produces more and better potentialities for struggle, or different and worse. Um, and I think that because the other thing that any new situation also throws up are new potentialities for retreat, reaction, defeat, and ruling class terror. So in a way, I think one of the key questions we need to ask is, how bad is this moment? And I think it's really bad. And I think we have to start from that recognition, um, rather than simply celebrating we absolutely show the resistance as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim, and some people here know me. I was a member of the International Socialists from 1968 to 1974. I founded the Edinburgh branch. Um, it grew quite a lot, and I think I contributed a lot to its growing. I was involved in the uh, rent strike 1972 73, and it was part of the big national campaign that the IS was a big part of. And we did, I think, it was to right to emphasize the role of the workplace. We did try to hold tight trade in people, try to get trade in people involved. I think it's only a fairly limited extent. Um, I was expelled in 1974, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I'm now a member of a uh, local organization here, Coalition People for Profit, which again, people who live locally are aware of. 
to play the very leading role in civic movement and hospital campaign. Movement people who talk profits abroad from doesn't isn't ignited about this understanding, and that's also in which I think that you know has come up when discussed speakers have discussed Spain and other countries. Most of the strength is also weakness. The Labour Party effectively hijacked the hospital campaign for its own interests. And I think that will tend to happen unless you build the movement bricks of evolutionary Marxist understanding. So what I would like to say to you today is um, I would suggest that you do enter into the international dialogue. And I'm going to particularly suggest that we discuss as an organization, I have a kind of connection with for a number of years. Um, it's an organization that had the kind of revolution on this week. We need to take meetings for all that. I've got some of the groups here. They discuss issues that are being discussed here of how economies should work in trade, how real revolutionary traction to work places in order to link the development of the mass group of the working class with the development of the party. If anyone wants to take these books, I've got them here. And I would also suggest that RS21 we thus start the dialogue with the Japan Revolution and Congress. I might say Nietzsche Broder did not have two articles published in International Socialism in 1960 and 1962. Owen Barker has told me he did submit more articles that weren't published. I think that's a pity because if they had been, then I think the development of international, um, international Marxist consciousness could have been generated a great deal. Thank you. Uh, can I have a copy? Yeah, I want to disagree about the neoliberalism in people's souls thing. I think uh, you was far too dismissive of it. No, I think we need to take it very, very seriously and then dismiss it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I think we need to take it uh, very, very seriously is I think if we want to explain what's happening in Britain today, uh, we need to have a very close look at how capitalism and the social programs of neoliberalism structures people's choices that they make and therefore their lived experience of capitalism, especially in the absence of any other sorts of political contestation. Otherwise, I think we're left, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be left on our group with explaining why teachers and nurses are going to vote for the Conservative Party and possibly might vote to, 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 to victory in, in, in the next election. I want to give you two, I want to pick up two examples. One is in education. <laughs> the high school teachers are familiar with this, really. Uh, performance management is the dominant form of pedagogy in the high school. Children coming from primary school, uh, knowing what they need to do, and following every piece of what they do, writing down what went well and even better bit. The three-step logic of performance management, operationalizing, measurement, and intervention is how teachers teach for about a decade in different schools. Uh, so when kids make bread, it's not bread, it's four C bread, and they could do something better to make four B bread. When people read a sonnet from Shakespeare, they write down their understanding after it's been marked, they write down that's a 6C understanding, and they need to, if they could have done this and this and this, it would have been a 6A understanding. Uh, and every child in the school, in a good or outstanding school, every child needs to know what they need to do to progress to the next level. And often the teachers and the teachers will stop them, whatever you want, by C, what do you need to do to get better? I need to get five A to get better and do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's not entering the soul, but it shapes people's lived experience. I think what we need to explain, though, but one thing I think is going to be increasingly important is to understand the changes to pensions and the housing market as something that's tightly combined that shapes how families behave and how families see the world when the welfare state's been rolled back. I think that's something we need to keep a close eye on because it's really so ideologically powerful in terms of what it's, uh, how it uh, uh, shifts and nudges families uh, and individuals to operate in, uh, in certain ways. Now, I've said all this is this is our times terrible, well, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but I think it says two things. Firstly, uh, we need this explanation to explain why the Conservatives might get in. And, and secondly, I, I think it points to the primacy of politics. Unless it's a widespread political contestation of these basic things, I don't think workplace struggle is going to uh, get very far. And I think that, I'm gonna, maybe this is controversial, maybe it's not. I think what well, obviously workers are most powerful when they're in the workplace, but I think that in the current phase of struggle against neoliberalism, the level of political struggle sets limits on and sets a bar to the development of, of industrial struggle. And I think we've had a very bad argument in, of, of 
look to our audience in the SDP about the relationship between politics and economics and everything else, and maybe uh, this weekend is an uh, opportunity to unpick some of that. Okay, um, I'm going to take collections, and um, we've had a lot of hands up, um, and I, I don't have time to take them all. We did start a little bit late, but I want to finish kind of on time and have time for a few of the speakers to come back because there was direct questions. Um, I mean, I would advise that the next the next session there's three meetings: one on social movements, one on Marxism, intersectionality, and identity, one on neoliberalism and how that's affected the working class. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's relevant stuff that you can go to. Please put your hands up there if you have things to say that you didn't get a chance to. Um, in this session, that would be great. Um, and also, they've got less speakers in those sessions, and they'll be smaller, so hopefully like, there'll be more chance for people to speak. Um, so yeah, we'll go with Alexis. Um, final, I'll just, maybe I'll make a few announcements now rather than right at the end. Um, accommodation, we've had more people offering as accommodation than people who need accommodation. So if you need accommodation, there definitely is room. So just come and let us know at the reception desk. Um, also, we're running low on volunteers for the crash tomorrow. So if you could do 45 minutes on the crash, um, that would be really helpful. Um, either come and find me. My number is on the crash, which is just like in the lobby. Um, so give me a text. I'll find me. So thank you. I just wanted to ask, <coughs> I wanted to ask uh, Lucia and uh, Neil a couple of questions about periodization and about the newness of neoliberalism. Because it seems to me, and I think Neil's uh, referred to this in some of his uh, recent articles, that uh, there is newness but, and there's some qualities that we don't come to that neoliberalism. But there's also great similarities with periods before uh, the uh, period of state capitalist welfare and the social democratic consensus. Which we should refer to. It seems to be sort of a spiral pattern going on. Um, I mean, I, I was slightly confused by the Chair's reference to the recent clips of the global division of labour, and it seems to me that the global division of labour went out with the invention of synthetics and increased well the state in the advanced industrial countries in the 1930s. So I'm, I'm not sure I followed that. Um, but in terms of uh, Neil's argument that greenfield sites are Key element of the neoliberal strategy that seems to me to also be quite an old phenomenon. I mean, if you borrow, follow the track of American foreign investment in the UK from the 1930s and 40s onwards, that you know, American foreign investors always prefer greenfield sites where they won't organise uh, labour. Um, but obviously, it became a qualitatively, uh, uh, there was a critical mass. Neoliberalism adopted the strategy more systematically. Um, just to make a final observation about my own recent experiences, I've, I've recently been um, teaching. Well, so I suppose the conclusion that I talk about is that we can usefully look at struggles before the period of the welfare consensus to, to look at struggles today when there wasn't the social safety, there weren't social safety nets, and people have been looking at struggles such as new unionism. The, the great unrest in, in the British working class experience. Uh, my own experience recently has been working with uh, casualised teaching staff at, at SOAS in the University of London, um, where we've seen quite militant struggles with it. And, and certainly, um, I mean, we're, we're about to embark on um, essentially quite militant action without the backing of our union, because the union's timetable for national action just doesn't fit with our timetable. And we've got uh, over 100 graduate teaching assistants have signed up to a pledge to take further action. Uh, we, we have to be careful about how we specify that action, but we have notified the employer in the process of making a formal proposal for 100% pay rise on the first day. We do have uh, students committed to this pledge for further action, which encompasses 5,500 outstanding essays. Um, and in the process of that struggle, it's, it's been very interesting to see the process of political learning going on within that struggle. All the arguments about uh, political parties being involved in the movement have come up within that struggle and been resolved as we tested different strategies. The arguments about the union, arguments about whether uh, uh, pop-up unions are an alternative, whether we need a new graduate teachers union, these are all coming up and being tested in the struggle. And, uh, hopefully, uh, watch this space. Okay, on the fountain, we'll see that question about the case is still ongoing. Um, how new is neoliberalism? Well, 
I think it is, even ideologically, uh, it was clear when people invented it in the 30s and 40s, they weren't simply going back to classical um, economics. Hayek's point was that the new order was something that has to be imposed on people because otherwise people would not actually accept the market. This position was actually similar to Marxism and for most of the humanist the communist communities. It was a terrible thing. People had to be woken out of this. So people had to be forced by the state to adopt a market solution. That's not a position that we thought of in the 1860s. This is a new position that, 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 that they were derived um, and, and it was seen as being new. That's why it's new liberalism in the 40s. I mean, the thing about people voting for the Tories, I mean, in 1955, um, the Tory party in Scotland got 51% of the vote, an absolute majority of votes and seats. The only thing anybody uh, in Britain has ever had that majority. It's not new for people to vote for right wing parties, including some crisis or even boom, and if there appears to be less, very few differences between the organisations. So if that in itself isn't, 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 isn't new, uh, I'm going to this. I think that I have some sympathy for the idea that in new liberalism conditions people behave in certain ways. I think Foucault exaggerates this enormously. By the way, his, his essays on, on biopolitics are very well worth reading. I just think the ultimate conclusions are wrong. And some of the way that we think about this and people are down not and so on. There's a problem with that. But come on, under, at least in Europe, under Stalinism, people adapted their behaviours to do what they were supposed to do because of the Stalinist regime. They, they behaved in certain ways and there was a kind of mask put on to the order they would be able to see to conform. They didn't really agree with it. They didn't necessarily ultimately affect how they thought about themselves. It was a kind of charade that people underwent. The same as people go through some performative stuff in terms of neoliberalism. I think that's actually a better comparison is neoliberalism and Stalinism. In the way which the ideology is quite a certain kind of behaviours people actually don't internally um, adopt. Colin Wilson's point about Stalinism is actually interesting. I mean, you know, in a way, Stalinism was, a, was like a drug that both poisoned the body of socialism but also preserved it in an odd way, especially the further away you were from Russia, using it was to actually have a bit of illusions in it. The trouble is nothing sort of substitute for that vision of socialism with anything else. Uh, and I mean, that means that the kind of oddity of people in Ukraine fighting an enormously heroic and a very inventive struggle in many ways for the, for the possibility of joining the EU. I mean, Benedict Anderson in his book Imagine Communities jokingly says towards the end, um, uh, you know, this is emphasizing the importance of the nation state, who would die for the EU? Well, Benedict, there's several hundred people in Kiev have actually died ostensibly for the EU. In other words, that's not really why they were dying, of course. The EU is a symbol of something they think is better than the other country. Last of it, but the point is there's no socialist alternative there at the heart of it that would actually take them on. Okay, so some of the points by China and, and, and Jamie. Um, the question, yeah, uh, I, I think that people in the ruling class are aware there's a problem with short termism. <coughs> the trouble is they don't know what to do about it. And it's not simply about short termism and the lack of overall strategy, it's also the way in which political parties pitch their, um, their solutions to a very small section of the new middle class. In particular, I'd fight over their votes and mean they do what they want in terms of vote tax cuts and so on to get them to vote for them. There's also a problem because neoliberalism, in a way, has produced far right responses, particularly in relation to migration, which is at the heart of one of the policies of you know, So, you can have a policy of actually leaving the EU about a referendum for this purpose, which would well happen. No business, no big business in Britain wants to leave the EU. They want to renegotiate the treaty. They may end up in a situation. In which they're actually forced to leave with all the problems that will cause for British capitalism because of this the way in which all this has Frankenstein monster has been created because there's no left response, you get far right response, which is producing this. One final point is about the, the problems of, of, of capital and do we want to help capital with Keynesian solutions and so on. The endless bleating of people like Will Hutton about this, you know, like, oh, why, 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 why can't we understand what they need to do? It's not our job to help capitalism get rid of its problems. Our, our job is to help it towards its deathbed, but if there's another crisis or increasing barbarism, which is not caused by working class response, but simply caused by the internal contradictions of the system, that will not be to our benefit. We have to cause the problems, not simply accept its internal contradictions. Mm -hmm. I think I have to reply to the question on the crisis, has it finished or not? So, I think uh, the crisis hasn't finished, and uh, if we also listen to what a kind of uh, critical bourgeois thinker says, uh, we, are wi we are witnessing a possibility of kind of centuries of uh, stagnation, lack of technological development. The rate of profit uh, has not go back, gone back to the levels of a uh, 2007 peak, and so we see that the rate of profit hasn't recovered. 
And also, while, um, yes, I want to also go back to the question about uh, colonialism and the division, or international division of labor. Uh, certainly, neoliberalism was a new form of uh, colonialism and uh, it uh, led to a new form of colonial division of labor. But we also see that there is an emergence of um, domestic capital in uh, countries like China, where Chinese capital is, uh, lending, is uh, climbing the, the value chain and uh, it's also expanding in countries in Latin America, Africa, in the rest of Asia and also creating alliances and, um, with uh, Russia and so on. And so if uh, in the first phase of the crisis, uh, Western imperialism uh, has uh, somehow shifted the crisis through quantitative easing and so on to, into the rest of the world, we see today that as the economies of these countries are still dependent on exports towards imperialist countries, Austerity is not creating the conditions for a global recovery. And so we see that uh, growth in uh, countries like uh, China, Brazil, and so on has uh, started to stop or kind of uh, has uh, kind of the, its rise has uh, started to slow down. And, and so I think that the kind of as a small these increasing difficulties at the international level are the root causes of the increasing international tensions that we see uh, at the global level. Just if you look at the last few years, we had a, had the possibility of a regional war in Syria. We had an imperial attack on, on Libya. We have uh, new tensions on Venezuela. We have uh, the question of Ukraine and so on. And so we see, yeah, that. Um, I think uh, the crisis is not over and it's leading to a new phase of major international tensions and also possibility of military, uh, military tensions. Um, so is it a kind of happy end of my talk? So there are new possibilities, yeah, everything's going bad, but somehow something new is emerging. I think that, uh, of course, the situation is bad, but if we compare this situation now to the situation 10 years ago during the alter globalization movement, we see that there is an increasing role, especially in the countries most hit by the crisis, there is an increasing role of the working class in these movements. And also, the examples I was uh, making about immigrant workers in Italy, but the same applies also to uh, the UK, where we see an increasing rate of unionization among immigrants. So on the one side, we have an incorporation of immigrant workers into the, the workforce. On the other side, we have witnessed in the last years an increasing eruption of anger of immigrants, like in the 2005 Banlieue riots in France, or in the 2011 riots in, in England. And so there is an enormous potential for struggle in society. And, uh, and I think this is an important point, so, and this is also kind of the existence of a multinational working class today in Europe. It's a main difference if we look back at the situation before the First World War or the Second World War. I'm not saying that if uh, there will be a major war internationally, this will play a major difference. Uh, a lot will depend on the capacity of the left somehow to enhance or realize this potential for interna internationalism today. And, uh, and I think uh, this is a, a major problem that uh, we have to face today in order to realize this potential that exists in society. I have listened uh, lots of times that uh, MPP movement has been anti-political. I'm not, I'm not a, theorist, a theorician, so I don't know um, how, what, what this exactly means. But what I know is that in the movement, um, uh, uh, the, the majority parties, the, 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 the institutional parties were not welcome, this is true. And the, the radical parties at the beginning were not welcome. But at the end, when they know us, when they see that we are in the movement to make it grow. When we were engaged in the movement, we were really welcome. And uh, lots of people see with good eyes that we were in a militant union. And also, I think that 
that we had some very uh, political demands, like no payment of the debt, direct democracy, defend the public services, uh, etc. And also we have a, a big, a big uh, action in the parliament to stop EMPs to approve the cuts. And I think these kind of things are highly political. For me, the movement was uh, anti-political in the institutional way, but not anti-political in general. Maybe uh, I have I mess up something theoretically, but uh, this is my idea, and this is what I I, I take. And for conclusions, I, I, I only have some questions, and I think um, I identify some questions in all the, the in all the talk and all the, in the people that has been uh, speaking in the in the room. And I think that uh, it's uh, we really need some key questions to answer, uh, and and maybe the. A good conclusion for this weekend would be a list of uh, questions to, un to answer in our local branches and in, in, our, in our own um, political um, uh, groups. And I think these questions, a proposal, uh, a little proposal of these questions could be uh, what, our, what are, are our key tasks as the left? What steps can we take to reveal class consciousness and find austerity through pushing radical working class organizations, and how we can help the left unite over these aims. And I think these this three, uh, three um, I don't know how to say in English, but yeah, these three areas are, uh, has to be in our main focus in the next months to start building a appealing organization that can be open, that can be full of young people, old people, uh, black, white, women, gay, etc. So I really, um, I really um, invite you to join join Eras Twenty One and to join unions and to fight back austerity. Everything. I mean, in terms certainly in terms of the trade unions, I think I'm slightly less pessimistic than you are. I, I don't know if people can be more pessimistic for me in terms of what potential there is amongst workers, but clearly we're ever such a long way from where we think we should be in terms of in terms of trade union movement at the moment. What we saw at the end of the day on the 30th of, uh, of November in, in 2011, at the end of the day, what we managed to achieve there, which was actually a bureaucratic mass strike. Um, hasn't delivered in any way what we thought the potential for it was. Um, I think it did teach us something about the key role that left activists can play um, within it. And for me, I suppose, as a revolution is a trade unionist, the thing is to look forward and to think, what, what is it that we need to do from here? But there'll be questions about where there is greater militancy at the moment, which I do think it's important. I do think it's important <laughs> to consider social movements and the importance that they importance that they have, but it's about questions about where is their great militancy, greatest militancy, where is the power, where's the greatest potential for power, and also where and how can we agitate um, around what's going on at the moment. I mean, certainly in UCU, we've been a we've seen a series of small but significant partial victories. I think that's the best way to put it. And what we haven't seen is that we, certainly we haven't been smashed either. And in fact, there's a growing militancy certainly in my union, um, amongst sort of less of the sort of usual suspects. I don't people often think, people often think of uh, university teachers as being amongst the most militant, but I think that they have been in recent times, and that's also to do with the liberals and everything. I think what I'm going to do is bring it back to the first question, which was directed at me, is that what can you do? And I think that, as this, as revolutionists and as trade unionists, there are various ways that you need to think. So one of them is on a practical level, what can you do on a practical level, you can help with you can help with putting the word out. And Another one is on the industrial front. What can you do on the industrial front? Well, you can make sure that no unison work that covers any of the work that the striking use of workers should be doing and all the rest of it. But more fundamentally than that, and this is what I think is 
one of the things which is key for revolutionary trade unionists is that we have to fight on an ideological front. And we have to find an, fight on an ideological front and we have to make very, very clear that what we're fighting for is the future of education. And I think on this, and I think I just want to end on this, and I hope that this comes up over this weekend as well, that we also have to have an idea of what it is that we're fighting for. And what it is that we're fighting for is something that we have, a, not only because it inspires people, we're not fighting just against things, but we're fighting for things. In my case, and the comment was sitting there as well, we've been talking quite a bit about education and what we think education could be like. But it's partly we need to talk about that because it inspires people to think, <coughs> but partly because in talking for that, we'll see what changes we need to bring about. And in seeing what changes we need to bring about, we'll see the sort of strategies that we need to have, and that will help us clarify our, our ideas around the importance of industrial and organised workers and the importance of social movements as well. Thanks very much. Okay, the next meeting starts in 15 minutes, but it's in the other building outside. No, fortunately not, it'll be a bit... Uh,